Welcome. Wow. <laughs> I know. It was probably so loud. <laughs> I just blew someone's eardrum out. <laughs> We're just really excited to be back, you guys. So excited. So excited. We, guys, we are playing with fire here. We yeah. literally are kind of recording right as we need these episodes. It's like almost we're, a real-time recording, like not we're, day we're of. We're panicking. But it feels like it a little bit, right? Oh my God, For the how past, fun would that be? That would be terrifying. It would be. <laughs> I, me, and when I, just, I think for you it no, would be fun. No, when I just thought about it, I was like, oh my God, and then you got to edit and then you got to cut and then you got to put it at, no, no. <laughs> no. Yes. So, or if we did like a live podcast recording. I mean, it would that, definitely be like, raw, I think that, you know, that would be fun. I would like yeah. that. But not like same day. Upload. No, I don't mm-hmm. know because it do takes that. me hours. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Because I Quite could literally. edit and just never listen to it again, and and just hope that it's okay. I don't function <laughs> like that, so I have to listen to it, edit it, and then listen to it again. Yeah. So, just make sure it's like good content for you. I just edit obviously. it and save it and upload. <laughs> don't even listen to it again. Oh man, this, I should have worn a different color. This is giving me very much Casper, the friendly ghost vibes. Yeah, like I, as I am usual. so like, yeah, I'm just glowing because I'm so white. <laughs> Jesus there. That's a little I mean, better. It's January. So, well, it is, but like we're it together. anyways, <laughs> what, what are we talking, talking about today, about? Mar? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I asked first. <laughs> you start <laughs> today. We are talking about attachment styles, which I feel yes. like on on the TikTok, it's a very oh the topic TikToker right oh now. my Jesus! I have a lot of clients that are like, so I was looking at my attachment oh style. Oh my and god, I'm like, same. Okay, same. And, and which you again, know what I'm? Go ahead. I think it's great that people want to educate themselves. Sure, right? I am sure. all for learning and evolving and growing and learning about yourself. Yeah. However, can we please? Just be mindful of where the fuck you're getting your information from. That's all yes. I ask. That's yes. all I ask. Here's what I ask that you do not live and die by this. Yes. Like the same way that you have a zodiac sign and there are pieces that fit you and pieces that don't. And the same way that maybe you're you're religious and there's pieces of yep. that religion that fit you and pieces that don't, or the same way that maybe you're you believe in like witchcraft and maybe there's sure. some things you take and some things you don't. Absolutely. It is not absolute. This is not black and white. You do not no. need to live and die by this attachment style. Please. It's that like is what languages. frustrates me. Yes. Right. That's Where what you frustrates can have me bits about and pieces. These. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Yes. <clears throat> so here's the special thing about this episode and the next episode. Is that what we call them? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. It's just, I, sessions came into my mind. Sessions? Yes. And I was like, is that even right? No, that's right. <laughs> I, I literally, you know, like when you say a word too much and you're like, or, or you write spell? it and you're like, like that's I, not. That's not how that's spelled, I don't think. What, what word was I spelling the other day? And I had to spell it so many times. It was like angry or like apart or something like that. And I was like, I'm not even spelling this right. This is wrong. It's got to be wrong. And it's I kind Googled of it and I was like, that happens. it is. Anyways, <laughs> sidebar. So the nice thing about these two episodes, but well, I just, just spilled beans there. <laughs> So we're breaking this into two episodes. This is going to be a part one and a part two. So for the first episode today, we are going to talk about what the attachment styles are, what they look like in childhood and what they look like in adulthood. And obviously throw in our little banter and talk about how it affects us too. Yes. Then we'll be coming back next week, AKA 30 minutes after this (laughs) podcast (laughs) and recording how you can potentially Well, like how you view them, how you can potentially change them and like, what does it all mean? Right. So just kind of giving an overview. And if you don't feel like, um, you like the attachment style that you're in, how can we move to a more comfortable one? Or how can we take pieces from one and create your own? Right. Again, these are just categories. It's not that you are black and white in these categories. So that is important to keep in mind throughout the entire time that we're talking in these next two episodes. I think the verbiage is what I think the verbiage is important too, right? Because if we're saying like how to change our attachment styles, when you are researching this kind of stuff, it says like, this is your attachment style and you're stuck with it for life. Right. So it's this very like doom and gloom of like, I could never change it. But here's the thing, just like anxiety and depression, that stuff doesn't go away. You learn to cope 
with it and yes. live with it effectively. Yes. It's the same thing as this. Yes. So please just keep that in mind. Yes. <clears throat> it's not like you're just going to automatically be like, okay, now I'm this one. Yes. That's not how this works. Yes. But thought work can take you mm-hmm. to the moon. <laughs> just like any other situation with thought work for sure. Yes. Yes. So let's do this. Attachment styles. There are four main attachment styles. But before we get into that, Stephanie. Yes. When was this theory even created? So attachment theory was created in the 60s and 70s by two different psychologists. One was British and one was Canadian. Not that that matters. But it's John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. They created this to describe the attachment between, they say mothers and their children. It can be caregivers. It doesn't necessarily have to be moms. But I think that's the assumption people have, right? When you think of who your first connection with as a baby, it's people generally think of the mom. Yeah. Um, they initially started with three attachment styles and then a fourth one was added later. And we go through, you know, the details of each one. And I think it's interesting to, when you're listening to these kind of sit back and reflect, like if you have a journal handy or your phone Mm -hmm. kind of write through which one you think speaks to you and why, Mm -hmm. right? Again, this isn't like set in stone, like, Oh, this is what I am. But if there are like clear cut details of like, this is absolutely how I function, that's okay too. Again, Mm -hmm. this is how you grow and evolve as a person. Mm -hmm. So let's get into this. Oh my gosh. My favorite TikTok guy. um, He's like a very like put together manicured man Mm -hmm. who discusses um, high fashion. Mm -hmm. And he's like, let's discuss. Or he maybe says, let's get into it. He says something like that, but the way you just said that reminded me of him. Oh, I love him. I, he breaks down like high fashion and like breaks down, like someone was like, give me a more affordable version of a Louis Vuitton Neverfull because they don't like the the branding and they want it yeah. more affordable because like who pays $2,700 for the damn purse. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> I want one, but I digress. But then he gave these different options and I was like, damn, yes. Thank you, sir. I love him. So again, sidebar. So the first one we are going to talk about today, we're going to do childhood first, and then we'll move into adulthood. So childhood first, I'll do the first two, Steph, you do the next two. So the first one, secure attachment, is when caregivers are available, sensitive, responsive, and accepting. Children with secure attachments learn to trust and have healthy self-esteem. So this, this would be like the epitome of what everybody wants, right? Like everybody would love a loving, supportive childhood. This is, a, I think, where Steph and I really try <laughs> to, to be this for our I kids, do. right? Like I we're do. doing our best. Um, but yeah, so that is just a overall welcoming, loving home. Um, no real disruptions. Needs are met. Um, if there's questions, they're answered. Like there's just this, this really healthy, strong connection, really healthy relationship between the caregiver and the child. The second one, anxious, insecure. So anxious, anxious, insecure attachment is when responses to children's needs are sporadic and children cannot rely on their parents to be there if they're threatened. They often will not go out and explore on their own. These children are also Steph gave me, Steph did all the research for this. So I was struggling to read one of the sentences. So I don't understand what you're So they're to... hoping like if I act distressed, my mom Thank will come you. save me. Yes. Okay, because I was like, what is hopes that the point? I know I was like, I'm having a fucking panic attack. <laughs> So, so they're hoping exaggerated, that exaggerated like emotional yes. response of like, okay, if I'm doing this, then, then they have to come save me. Yes. So these children will eventually become needy, angry, and distrustful. Yikes. Mm-hmm. That does not sound great. So this, um, in my mind, this is what this is saying to me is that it's any attention is better than no attention. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to get my needs met any way that I can. And that might look like that I'm going to create these disruptions or this distress or this, um, like panic uh, mm-hmm. to be able to get your attention because, because I don't, if it seems I'm not serious, getting, then you yeah. have to pay attention to me. Yes. Right. Yes. Number three, avoidant insecure. 
is -hmm. when parents struggle accepting and responding sensitively to their kids' needs. So they minimize their feelings. Like you don't have anything to be sad about. There's nothing to cry about, Mm -hmm. reject their demands and don't help with difficult tasks. It's Mm -hmm. the, well, you got to learn someday, right? Like you're going to have to do it eventually. Excuse me, which here's the thing. I'm not saying that that's necessarily a, excuse me, a bad thing. However, our job is to teach our children life skills. We yeah. have this assumption as adults of like, well, they should be able to figure it out. They're fucking yeah. kids, according to don't who, teach them how. And they figure it out exactly. Right. But again, if you think about the mindset of our parents or caregivers or whomever, it's like, well, I was left to fend for myself, so right. you're going to be just fine, right? right? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, these children don't typically ask for help, and they often feel like they have to help their parents with their own emotional needs. So parents mm-hmm. who come to their kids to talk about their own stress. They learn to shut down their feelings and minimize showing their negative emotions. So anything that's not happy, you don't show. You just fucking suck it up, buttercup, right? Mm -hmm. Like that kind of attitude. Do you think, I have a question. Do you think in this one that instead of the um, parents like coming with their own problems to the kids, do you think that the kids could internalize like they're really stressed out? You know, I just need to- Sure to, you know, eat this right now because it's just not a big deal. They're very stressed. Yeah. Or how many times have you heard a kid say, I don't want to tell my mom because she's going to freak out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like, I'm responsible for her emotional reaction. No, you're not. Yeah. And I tell kids all the time, like as a mom, I would rather know that my child is struggling with something, no matter how hard it is to hear it, than Mm -hmm. not know and not be able to help. I agree. But they take on the responsibility of like, well, I don't want to cause them more problems. They're stressed out about work or we don't have a lot of money or, you know, fill in the blank. Um, The fourth one that was added later is disorganized, insecure attachment. So parents reject, ridicule, and frighten their children. Again, I think that this, my perception is that this is based on their own past, right? Mm, Because these parents often have unresolved trauma of their own and these children can become aggressive towards parents and refuse to go to them and often become overly self-reliant to me. When I hear this, I think about a lot of the kids at the hospital that we worked at, mm-hmm. right? So if yes. your parents had a traumatic upbringing, they don't know self-regulation skills. They don't know how to be empathetic. They know trauma. And mm-hmm. so that's why that cycle continues because that's what they know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it really sucks because coming in from the outside and working with some of those kids, your heart hurts because you're like, all I want is for you to feel safe. And right now that doesn't seem possible. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of just planning to get them to, you know, their 18th birthday when they move out. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's what a lot of our job I felt like was Mm -hmm. Um, just because I can't control, like you're my client. I can't control how your parents treat you. I can absolutely, we can have family sessions. I can beg and plead and Mm -hmm. try to have all of these different things said and done. But realistically at the end of the day, let's plan, let's focus on what we can control and that's getting you out. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like this is a real or a TikTok that's everywhere right now where it's like, you're really mature for your age and age. And it's like, ha, that's trauma. Like, yes, yes. While I am annoyed by the real, it's yes. not necessarily untrue, right? Correct. Correct. Kids who are not getting their needs met will eventually learn to do it on their own. And then they become mm-hmm. adults. And I am by no means saying that I had a traumatic childhood at all. Mm-hmm. I am just a very stubborn person. And so I don't like to ask for help, but what that Mm -hmm. turns into is like, you're drowning in your life because you refuse to ask for help because I can do it by myself. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So So before we, I was going to say, before we move on to adulthood, what one do you think you are? (laughs) So this, this is hard. For me, let's, because I let feel... me just put a disclaimer on this. We love our parents so, so much. much, and I so love mom, Steph's parents so much. If you're listening, do not take this personal, because I love you, and I know that you love, love you more than anything in the world. We love. I will you, also preface this by saying my mom was 19 when she had me yeah, and turned 20 baby. the day she came home from the hospital. My dad was Jesus 21. Christ. They were babies. Granted, I know people have kids when they're like fucking 13. But sure, this was but 1984. Again, so, <laughs> you're still a baby. <laughs> literally. I yeah. had my child at 29 and yeah. I felt like, not that I was a baby, but like, I was thankful that I waited till I was almost 30 to have a kid. Yes. I had no oh business God, yes. having a child at my mom's age. Oh, I would have been a mess. <laughs> None. I will also say that 
my parents both, like I've said before, had very, very traumatic upbringings. And so when I was looking through these things, I was like, man, which one was I? Because my mom was there when I got hurt. She was there when I was crying, right? She was there to support me. But I think there were other times that she really struggled with her own emotion regulation and not that she would ever reject me or ridicule me. It was never like, I'm going to call you names or be like, get away from me. But Mm -hmm. my mom's way of coping with frustration was to ignore Mm -hmm. Right. So like avoid and ignore or kind of not acknowledge. And so that Mm -hmm. would lead to like internalizing. And I found myself doing that sometimes with bug. And I'm like, nope, we're not doing that. We're going to talk about how we feel. So I think it sounds weird, but I think I would be a mix of like secure attachment with disorganized Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because while it was consistent in some ways, it was also inconsistent. I think, and I was thinking about this the other day as a baby and a small child, I not like I can remember being an infant or a toddler. Right. But like we have have tons of photo albums, right. Where like, you can tell my mom was so happy because I was born. Right. Like that's all she ever wanted was to be a mom. Yeah. And then once Steph learned how to talk and be an asshole that changed, but I was thinking about that with bug. I was like, it's so different when your kids can't talk to you. Right. And you have to tend to their every need because you don't actually know what's going on. And then when they are able to express their needs for me, there's been more times of like frustration where I'm like, Oh my God, it's not even that serious. And then I'm like, don't do that though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yes. 100%. (laughs) And when my son opens his mouth, I'm like, this week, like, yeah, you are definitely me or you're definitely yeah. your uncle or yep. There's your dad, you know, yeah. like it's, oh, man. it's very interesting to me how things come across sometimes, but I never, I shouldn't say never. I don't want to be an invalidating mom. Yeah. There's a struggle with balance sometimes when I know in my heart of hearts, what he is upset about right now is not going to matter even in 20 fucking minutes. Oh my God. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's really not. Where I'm like, I promise. Okay. Like you're going to be fine. Like the fact that you forgot your fucking snow pants, <laughs> you're going to be okay. He was pissed you're, because I forgot his life. You're going to make it. Like, I was just like, bro, you can bring it back tomorrow. I promise it's going to be okay. And then but his everyone staff, looked at me. Oh my God. <laughs> he's like, yeah, I could only get two books of the library. Cause I didn't return the other one. I don't care about returning books. And I was like, wow, let's take a step back for a second. Let's, let's, have let's a be deep grateful breath. for the fact that you got to get two books through the nose, through the nose zero. out the mouth. <laughs> like, let's get it together. What That's, do you think that you are? Is, um, I think. Uh, see, I am lucky because I don't think my dad knows what Spotify is or <laughs> Apple Music. And oh, I am Richard. also lucky because I my mom knows what Spotify is, but I don't think she knows how to get on it. Um, so <laughs> no, no one's going to tell them. No, I'm just kidding. I, whatever I would say here, I would say to them, to their face, because um, sometimes we need a slice of humble pie. <laughs> Um, I would say I am a mixture of avoidant, insecure and secure attachments. That's what it was when I was younger because my needs were always met. Always, always, always. I never went without food. I never went without, um, like rides to like practices that I wanted to do. Like I would, they supported me through sports. If I said like enough is enough, they let me quit. Mm -hmm. Um, like they, they had really good structure and boundaries, um, more so my mom than my dad. My dad, my dad would like numb out playing cards with friends where we, it would be like 12 hours and we'd be like, bro, we haven't, eaten. Pool, so. we haven't eaten today. And like, there's food in the house, but like Tara, he was like, just have a donut, like get a can so of I've beans, learned. pop it open, yeah. eat it out of the Literally can. a can of corn, <laughs> can of corn. So, um, so secure attachment. Yes. Like obviously like, and we did things, right. We did things as a family and like went on camping trips and all that. But (laughs) my mom also came from a very traumatic background. And I honestly think that if I sat down my uncles and my aunts, my aunt and my mom and like gauged, like who thinks they went through trauma? They'll say my, no. my, my uncle, who's a psychotherapist, would be like, oh, my God. Woo. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> we are, and everyone else would be like, what? What are you talking about? Yep. 
my grandma was an amazing, amazing woman. And I miss her literally every day. But my grandpa, um, he did some damage. He did some absolute damage, which then in turn, you know, I mean, you don't live through what she lived through and then just consist like there, there's there's remnants right there's remnants of that relationship that carry through and and you project you project on because you haven't learned I mean you're taking care of six kids in like the god when was she born I don't even know but like six kids in the 40s and 50s like because my yeah like 40s and 50s because my mom was born in 56 and she was towards the younger so like taking care of all these damn kids in a recession and shit. Come on. So like, I remember one, I, uh, my favorite thing was to sit down and have talks with my grandma. And my grandma was like, one year I had to choose between boots and a winter coat and my shoes had a hole in them. So I had to get the boots. So I went the whole winter without a coat. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like what, how do you, I don't even, whatever. That's a whole nother, like that's a whole nother topic we can talk about. Family trauma. Yes. Yeah. Literally family trauma. So I, when my mom, And I I would say this is more my mom, right? Because my dad would, like, he wouldn't, like, maybe he was, like, anxious and secure because he just was not responsive. It was like he just kind of numbed out. Mm -hmm. Like, he just wouldn't respond. It's not that he'd be like, oh, suck it up. Or, like, you know, like, I would, like, we would act out to get his attention. But it was more so we were like, dad, (laughs) come on, my mom. Were you scared of your parents? My dad. Yeah, absolutely. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Same. Mm -hmm. Not that like my, my parents spanked us, but like, I mean, I was scared of my mom too, honestly. Cause she, she is little, (laughs) though she be little, she be fierce. Like Mm -hmm. she is like, when she gets in her rages, I'm like, damn, like, Mm -hmm. so yeah, like moments. Yes. But not, I knew that they loved me. Yes. So my mom working three jobs, right? Cause my dad and my mom divorced when I was two working three jobs. Like she was stressed the fuck out constantly. So we would get that projection when she would come home of like, scream, God, I just remember her fits. And it was never like screaming in our faces, like, meh, 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 but it was like, just like, she would come home and if things weren't done, you would be up. And you, they would be like, you would be up till midnight doing what you needed to do. And it didn't matter. And then you would go to school the next day. Like it was wild sometimes. And it wasn't all the time. It's not like we were like, oh, yeah. well, Tara, Tara was anxious for mom to come home. But me being the younger kid, I was like, whatever, like it is what it is. And and now I look back and I'm like, wash the fucking dishes, you asshole. Like mm-hmm. that was your job. Wash the fucking dishes. Tara, not, now Tara's anxious and you're, and you're like, oh, I can't stay focused. <laughs> like because you didn't do your fucking job. You had one job, but whatever. So I definitely think that I learned, and especially with her working three jobs, like, and my dad working and having rental properties, I learned to be self-sufficient. We mm-hmm. learned to, we had to do what we had to do. And we, um, we would walk home from school. Like we would take the bus, like we were pretty independent kids. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, but I, the one part that I don't necessarily agree with this is like minimizing our negative emotions. Like, I think we internalize that. That's why I asked when we were talking about it, because it's not like my mom would come to us and tell us her problems. Like you could, we could assume that she was stressed out because of the yelling and screaming. So then I think that we then internalized like this isn't that big of a deal. We need to just keep it under wraps. Stop fucking doing this. And we just learned not to share. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like we would if it was big enough, but I honestly, now that I think about it, I can't remember going to my mom about problems at all. No, I, I can't remember. I can't remember. I literally can't remember saying once discussing an issue with my mom, I which I'm sure is because I always like black and white, trouble. but I feared getting in trouble for what was going on with me. I would talk about some things like when the bullying was really bad in middle school. Like I went to my mom crying saying I wanted to quit school because these girls are making my life a living hell. And she was like, you're absolutely not going to stay home and do school. You're going to fucking go to school. Like basically Mm -hmm. like you're going to prove to them that they can't ruin your life. Yeah. But my eighth grade self was like, my mom hates me and she's making me go to school. (laughs) Yes. I, that is one thing I was bullied because I had hairy legs because fucking German. So I came home and I bawled and I begged my mom to let me shave my legs and she did. And I mean, these girls were like trying to fight me. Like, yeah, I didn't have it. Yeah. 
I didn't have any of that, thank God, because I would have went down with a one-two like, sucker punch <laughs> immediately. Best friends like getting everybody to hate you, and just like, I yeah, I wanted to quit school. I was like, this is the fucking worst. I hate it so much. And I think at that point, I had like maybe two close friends, sure, because these other girls like made my life a living hell. Obviously, looking back, I'm like quitting school quote unquote or doing you know online school which wasn't even an option the internet wasn't even a fucking thing so I don't know I was what gonna I say I was gonna do that literally didn't come teacher, until like, like junior year but yeah or we were gonna get the pamphlets uh, probably oh. the book the book set so my mom could be my teacher yeah no well that would have been fucking terrible could you imagine no I can't I can't and that's the thing I never had me. to be I never had to be physically self-reliant because my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Like she cleaned Sorry. houses and my dad works jobs and had a business and stuff. But I feel like more emotionally I had to be because in my mind, not that she wouldn't have been supported. I just was worried that she would be upset with me if things were going on or if I was doing something. Because I remember having some conversations of like, well, what did you do to make them mad? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mm, well, looking back, I'm like, I don't know. I existed. <laughs> I'm sure I did do something right. because I was defending right. myself. Right. And I never was physically aggressive towards my parents no. verbally, oh probably. And not like making threats to them, but being sassy. Like I've yeah. been sassy oh, yeah. since I could talk, you know, that Literally. was just my thing. I could use my words to hurt people. Um, but never my dad. And I was never physically scared of my dad. Like I knew my dad would never hit me because of how he grew up, but I was always scared of disappointing my dad. Yeah. Always. And that stayed with me for a very long time. Not that I didn't care about disappointing my mom, but it was something different about my dad. I don't know. Why. It is. It's the same way. I'm the same way. Like, I think that's what I search for in my adult life is approval for my dad. And mm -hmm. I know that he loves me. And I know that he, he, he more, he like, I would say the past year, he said more like validating statements to me than my whole entire life. Like before he left for Florida, he was like, just want you to know, I'm really proud of you. And like, looked like he was going to cry. Like, and I was like, you're going to die. What are you doing? Oh, well, in my head, I, I called Tara and I was like, I think dad has cancer. Like, I think something's going on. He told me he was proud of me. And she goes, he told me he was proud of me too. What's happening? And I was like, he's, something's going on. He's not telling me the whole truth. I'm calling him. <laughs> so like, so I, I think that I've always searched for that though. That, that, that to me is where the anxious insecure comes from. Now, again, not that it was that. Yeah, not that I had exaggerated distress to like get him, but like I would go with like my accomplishments. So it's mm -hmm. more so like I wouldn't create problems. I would be like, look what I did, look what I did, look mm -hmm. what I did. You know, fucking left me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. Say something. Um, say something. I'm giving up on you. <laughs> say something. I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah. So what does that look like in adulthood? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, now attachment styles in adulthood, ladies and gents and non-binary folks, secure attachment in adulthood. So the first one, again, I'll do the first two stuff. I'll do the last two. So secure attachment in adulthood are generally adults who are honest, supportive, trusting, comfortable talking about their feelings and have successful intimate relationships where are y'all at because y'all are Ooh. unicorns <laughs> where, where the fuck are you no i'm just kidding and that's why that's why we are trying to say that's why we preface this in the beginning there are parts that you can pull from you can yeah. be parts of this it's mm -hmm. not like either you're one or the other and that's yep. it like there can be moments where you ebb and flow in them the second one anxious insecure attachment in adulthoods generally looks like you got clingy kids, you got a clingy adult. They're demanding, possessive, and often codependent. They are consistently second guessing if they've done too much or too little in the relationship and often feel the need to seek reassurance. Yuck. Mm -hmm. It's rough. Those, to me, are self-explanatory. <laughs> well, and because what happens when you're constantly seeking reassurance from your partner, they're going to be like, are you fucking kidding me? How many times do I have to say I love you or that you're doing great? 
Well, and also if you're constantly seeking that, then you're constantly putting your eggs in that other person's basket. Mm -hmm. And so you will live and die. Like we've talked about in the judgment, you will live and die by their criticism. Mm -hmm. So for like, if something's so small, like, oh, you didn't pack my lunch the way like that you normally do. then it's like, I'm a fucking idiot. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I I fucked up. They hate me, blah, blah, blah. And then it's this, this spiral Mm -hmm. for what? Or on the flip side of they don't love me. They didn't pack my lunch the same way. Yeah, Maybe I overslept by five minutes and I had, I had to rush to put your lunch together. Dude, lately yes. bug has been like when he, when something happens and I don't notice right away, his initial response is, Oh, what? You don't care. I'm like, where the fuck Literally. is this coming from? How are they the same kid? How are they the same fucking kid? Dude, I don't know. But he came out of swimming the other day and he was like, you didn't see that I almost died in the pool. And I was like, yeah. Okay, so you don't all, care about me. First when did all, I say I've that? I've been watching you. So what are you talking about? And I got caught on the can also stand up me and I was like her leg wasn't on top well, of you she wasn't holding you under with her foot you're here right now so you survived I'm like what the you fuck? made it I got frustrated and, and I was like I need you to please stop saying that I don't care about things because that's hurtful oh my gosh Stephanie our kids are anxious and secure attached I know I don't know how that happened <laughs> seriously what the fuck <laughs> I'm doing oh, my best like, okay they literally are though both of them in the exact same way but again think about how we work 87 jobs and we're always busy and we're kind valid. of emotionally spent valid and so, valid valid you know what I mean and it's not making yes. an excuse for us but that's the reality of our life right and I feel like shit when I've been working all day and he just wants to show me something and I'm like oh here I don't go. give a fuck like I don't <laughs> but that's no that's I don't want to play too. Legos God, no. (laughs) That's the other thing too, is like them starting to be able to read and learn emotions and all of that at the very, the very beginning start of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And now where we have been, I really do feel like that's helped cultivate this insecure attachment because half nine months of the past two years were spent us screaming at them because of online schooling and us trying to also be there for clients and like be online and manage their schedule managers. So like, realistically, I know exactly how it happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because I've always been a very attentive mom always. Mm -hmm. But again, these past two years has just been a literal living nightmare for the entire fucking world. So how can you not feel anxious and insecure in life in general? Because there's there's so much ambivalence. Yes. We're going to get them through it. That's all I have to say about that. We will. We will. And they ebb and flow, right? They ebb and flow. Because Sophia said some nice statements to me of like, mom, you always fix everything. I really like that I can talk to you. And I'm like, oh yeah, my heart. Literally. So there's moments where we're not fucking up all the way. (laughs) And here's the thing. There's no fucking manual, right? That's hopefully that's what you hear from us, right? We we're therapists and our, we should bunny ears should be able to have kids that are expressive and communicative. We should, we can, we can place all these expectations Mm -hmm. on ourselves, but the reality of the situation is we're human. And so are our children and we fuck them up just like how you think you fuck your kids up. And here's the thing you ebb and flow maybe one season of your life, you're going to be more in one of these attachment styles and maybe another season of your life, you know, you'll be in a different one, which we'll talk about kind of coming up as we talk about where we are in adulthood, but like, Mm -hmm. it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's going to be okay. You can come back from it. It's going to be okay. And own your shit. Don't avoid it. Don't deny it. Own it. So you can change it just like anything else. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Avoidant insecure adults are generally adults who refuse to commit and they will keep people at a distance due to being fearful of connection and commitment. I have several clients who kind of fit the mold for this, right? Whether it's because their parents had a really unstable marriage or they didn't have a healthy example of relationships. Like, fuck that. I'm not going to commit ever because that looks terrible. Right. They can be dismissive to others who attempt to get close to them, Mm -hmm. right? And I've had a recent experience with a client who they were trying to date somebody with an insecure avoidant attachment, and they were anxious, insecure. Those don't mix. Those don't mix, right? One is seeking assurance. The other one is like, don't, I don't don't want you that close. Don't don't, touch me. I don't want you that close. Please back up. I have no desire to do this, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. If you are avoidant insecure, be upfront about that. That's okay. If you don't want to commit to people, cause that's not your thing, just be upfront about it and say, commitment's not for me. I'm just here to have fun. Or, you know, I just want to be friends or whatever. Again, own it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Disorganized insecure adults often struggle to self-regulate their emotions and can have tumultuous relationships, whether that looks like physically tumultuous, emotionally, um, all the things, right? It's different for each person, I think. Self-regulating your own emotions is something that I wish everybody could learn in childhood, but I don't have control over that, right? So right. I teach it when I can to whoever I can. I try <coughs> to do that with my son. I'm still learning how to do it myself. There's times that I'll message Mari. I'm like, I want to fucking rage out right now. I want to rage out. absolute flip urge tables. to fucking flip the fuck out right now is real. And I become overwhelmed by my emotions, but I have to remember, I am allowing myself to become overwhelmed by my emotions instead of telling myself, Hey, I'm here right now. This is what I have control over. This is what I can do. This is what I'm going to do because fucking raging out and throwing shit's not going to solve anything. Not, not a thing. <laughs> not one thing. It's literally not going to solve a fucking problem. Like not one, <laughs> not at all. It's going to let people know that you're angry. Yes. It's the only thing it's going to let them know. They're going to have no idea what you're angry about. No what idea what need. the emotion is going on, what you need, anything. And, and reality is you raging out is just going to scare the shit out of people and they're not going to want to be by you. So yes. we understand, we get, we get the, the want to just be like, are you fucking kidding me? Mm-hmm. Here's the thing, do it in your room, come back out, put together. Mm-hmm. And that is not putting on a front. That's not putting on a face. It's understanding you're allowed to have those emotions, have them, feel them. Do not project them onto other people. It's not fair. The other day I asked Bug if he was scared of me. I was like, are you scared of me? Either I asked if he was scared of me or I said to him, I don't ever want you to be scared of me. He's like, well, I'm not scared of you, but like when you get mad, like you sound really mean. And I was like, "Mm, that's a very accurate statement. And I was like, ask Soph if she's scared of me. I hate that feeling. I never wanted him to be scared of me because here's the thing. I was scared of my parents and that led to being anxious because I internalized everything. And I said, I don't ever want you to be scared to tell me things or to do things because of how I'm going to respond to something. And I told him, I said, I'm working on that. It just takes a lot of practice. And so Mm -hmm. again, that's me showing my human side to him of like, I'm not fucking perfect. He'll always bring up, you told me you were going to stop yelling at me and that you were working on it. And I was like, and I am every single day. You literally have no idea how much I'm working on every (laughs) single day of my life. And it's not like I sit here and scream at my kid. You guys like, let's be real. I don't scream at him, but here's the thing. There are times when my, whatever's happening in my life is a lot. And that's my initial reaction. It's like a, it's like an impulsive reaction. Right. And then after mm-hmm. I do it, I'm like, God damn it. That's not what I wanted to do. That's not how I wanted to handle this situation. So I go back and I say, you know what? I did not want to yell just now. I'm sorry, because it doesn't solve anything. It's just freaking right. him out or pissing him off. And then he shuts down when he gets upset he will shut down. And then I get more anxious because I'm like, now you're not talking. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know what to do. And then I get amped up. Mm-hmm. I'm really working hard to fix that too, because I don't want him to think, well, I got to solve this problem on my own because my mom doesn't care or my mom's mad at me. So I have to figure this out on my own. I don't ever want that. We don't want it. But the thing is, is we're not in control of it. I know. So that's the other hard aspect too, is like, we can teach them all the coping skills in the world. We can teach them how to attempt to regulate their emotions and things like that. They have to want to choose it. And the same with any other human being going through this experience, you have to want to do that. And sometimes it's hard to want to choose that in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. That's where this mindfulness comes in and where like living intentionally and with purpose and all of these things. That's why we talk about that and preach about that so much. Because if you are not aware of yourself in the moment, how can you control yourself like Mm -hmm. how can you reel yourself back in if you if you're off in fucking left field you know Mm -hmm. so where obviously you're not in a relationship now but where do you think you were in your relationship in your marriage oh I was anxious and secure 100 because I was also very young when we got together Mm -hmm. I was 21 turning 22 I wanted nothing more than to be loved by somebody and to be accepted and to be um, just in a relationship. But I was also the one that was like, you're not going to look at other girls. You can never do this. You can never do that. Like I, I wanted to be the center of his world. Right. And like nobody else was there. And like, that's not realistic. Like, no, yes. I don't want you like cheating on me, which he never did. He would have never done. But like, (laughs) I was so insecure in who I was as a person that I didn't want any outside, outside sources influencing him in any other way. And I did seek reassurance a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. 
especially in the beginning. And for a while, I would say I never wanted to like rock the boat. If something came up, I was like, no, I'll just keep it to myself. It'll pass. Like it's mm-hmm. fine. Um, and now I know that I will never be that woman again, mm-hmm. ever. Do you agree that you were too? Yeah. And like, as you were talking, I was kind of reflecting on it more and more. And I kind of realized, like, I don't think that I was that in the beginning, but no. because I stayed with somebody who was, who treat me, um, who, the, where the treatment was so chaotic, like, like really well or not great or okay, or like, okay for weeks. And then there's a huge, fa- like, like the, it was so, um, not chaotic. Isn't the right organized. Yes. Disorganized. It was so all over the place that it eventually, and then because of the infidelity, it led to me like having this tighter grasp and this tighter grasp and like pulling in and pulling in and pulling in to the point where I was like, like anxious and secure to the hilt. Mm -hmm. to the hilt, because I was like, I can, if I can control everything, then I can control whether I get cheated on or not. And Mm -hmm. I can control whether or not this relationship lasts. And because I have all of these societal expectations in my mind, I don't want to quote fail at, at like this relationship because we've had so many struggles, so many different things have happened. Like I want us to come out on top and like, you have to recognize that when you're in a relationship, like you both have to want that. Mm -hmm. And not that I think that, again, I don't think my ex is a horrible person. I don't, I don't ever want to portray it in this sense of like there were, we both had mistakes in this relationship. Right. Um, And we were both, like you said, we were both fucking young. Mm -hmm. We met at an eighth grade dance. We dated on and off through high school. We dated on and off through college. Like, and then we got married at 24, mm-hmm. 25, yeah, 25, I, was 25 I think. The fuck and then I, know I get married at 25. I, I, we didn't know a fucking thing. I think we were 24 <laughs> and then I got pregnant at 25 and had her at 26. Mm. So like babies and also like so many rapid fire, big life changes happened. Like the, the weekend we, like the week that we got married, I started a new job. We bought, a, well, like I, the house was in my name, but we bought a house and got married. Mm-hmm. Like that like and had furniture delivered painted like that's how ours was carpet like we we did everything in a fucking week are you joking me mine was like two months but yeah like are you joking me who the fuck does that Mm -hmm. like you know so there were also outside factors but as you were talking I was like man because I I didn't ever feel like I was like "Mm, I don't like myself but like as the relationship went on I was like why am I not good enough Mm mm-hmm it was that constant questioning. And it was like, bitch, you are good enough. This mm-hmm. just isn't the relationship for you. What the fuck? I think honestly, what fed into my anxious and secure attachment with him is prior to him, I had had one serious high school boyfriend for a year. I was very in control of that relationship. I was an asshole, but like, I was very secure in who I was. And I was like, you're not gonna fucking tell me how to live. Bye. But then after that, I didn't have relationships. Like I had situationships with people and I never felt good enough for them because there was always somebody better and Mm -hmm. all of my friends had secure relationships and I wanted it so fucking bad and so that just led to me again feeling like I wasn't enough for people and it just fed into well now I just got to do everything that they want to do or how they want Mm -hmm. it done because I just want to be accepted do you Mm -hmm. at all think that your attachment style in your marriage was also disorganized and secure? I do because I don't feel like I really got, I don't feel like I got a chance to, not a chance. I don't feel like how I learned to regulate my emotions until later in life when I made an active effort of like, you're done being a miserable bitch. I was very much like an uncontrolled Gemini, very much the two sides, Mm -hmm. like very much like super happy, excited. And then like angry and blah, blah, blah. Like that bipolar, how they talk about that bipolar, like just feeling those emotions deeply. I absolutely was that person. And I would say that I was more pessimistic than even just like realistic in relationships. So it was, I definitely could agree with that. And then also I don't feel like he knows how to regulate his fucking emotions at all. So 
Like, I mean, let's just put that. I mean, I've done, I'm not in a relationship with him now. So that very well could have been changed, but yeah, nope. Mm -hmm. There's no regulation. Um, But I also, I could also see this too, of playing the devil's advocate with myself of that, my constant back and forth, like hot and cold could have absolutely pushed some of those moments for him to be like, what the fuck? Like, Mm -hmm. so. Because I didn't express my needs. I would just internalize it. And then be short and shut down, leaving him to wonder what the fuck's wrong with her now. Yeah. Yeah. And then like taking it a step further after the, my marriage, I feel like I moved into avoidant insecure Mm -hmm. just because I was like, I don't give a fuck about you. You are, I am using you right now. Mm -hmm. Like in like certain relationships that. (laughs) Whereas I'm like, I will never be in a fucking relationship again. (laughs) Like, and I th- like, so they weren't relationships, right? Like yeah. I didn't consider them relationships, like situationships. Um, like that's very much so how I felt. Like, mm-hmm. I think deep down I was like, man, I just want to be loved, but like, not by you. <laughs> like, it's not, I'm not here. It's not, so, not, you. not you. So please leave. <laughs> um, anyways, <laughs> like, yeah, we're done. <laughs> the, night, the, the, the day, the night, the moment it's over. Me. Now I feel like I very much so 70% am secure attachment. I will say that I think it's more than that. No, I still really do battle with expression, (laughs) expression, expressing my needs or expressing my wants due to fear of rejection. Sure. So I struggle with that. And I like, it's getting better. It's absolutely getting better. So maybe I'll say 75%, but there still is that like, Ooh, mm-hmm. should I say this? And it's mm-hmm. like, just fucking say it. I eventually get to that point though in my head where I'm like, just fucking say it. What does it matter? <laughs> we were talking so. before we started recording too. And mm-hmm. I was like, honestly, looking through these, just like the love languages, I feel like they can change based on who you're with. Oh, I'm I absolutely. really truly do. And people may absolutely. disagree and that's fine. You don't have to agree with me. But my perception is that this can change based on your partner as well. Oh, because if you have a partner yes. that makes you feel safe and that validates you and is empathetic, then your attachment to them is going to feel more secure than somebody who's invalidating and dismissive. Yeah. Were you going to combat me just now? Were you going to argue? No, I I wasn't going to combat you. I was going to talk about like what I think Jeff's was when he was growing up. But realistically, like, I think in the beginning, maybe it was, it was one of the, the more difficult ones, but I think his parents now are secure attachments. So he like, cause I was like, how is he a secure? Cause he is secure attachment all day long. Do you think he was at first though with you? I think he was avoidant insecure. Agreed. <laughs> because everything was new, insecure. not yeah. in terms of a new relationship, but like you were new to him and how no, things a whole new relationship. You. Like his yeah. relationships before were not like our relationship. Right. That's what I mean. So he's like, I, yeah. uh, I don't know how to navigate this. What's happening? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look at us. We've grown to secure. T- we're, it's we're a fucking Disney fairy tale movie. You, I mean, I mean, honestly. Give me my fucking roll. Where's <laughs> what kind of animal do I get? I want an animal. Anyways. So that concludes for this episode of Attachments One. Ones. Part one. Anyway, I just really felt like I don't know. I had to go into like a Mortal Kombat voice. I I don't really <laughs> and a lightning. Him. Yeah, we were getting too, too emotional, so I had to lighten it up. Was there a humor one? Can can we can we come up with another one? Like, are they just use humor to deflect everything? Yeah, me. Oh Anyways, my God. um, so this wraps up part one of attachment styles. And next time we're gonna come back, we're gonna talk about how do you not how can you change them right but how can you start to adopt other principles of other styles what does it look like what are some steps um, that we can do to kind of put the work in so yeah if this has been interesting to you and you've liked it please like share subscribe comment tag us in your stories anything we really appreciate all of the feedback even if you didn't fucking like it please anything we, we need to hear it. We want to know it. Mm-hmm. So you can find Steph at SpookyFitMom13 
Uh, you can find me at BEA underscore XO11. We are at Rewriting Her Story Podcast. That is all on Instagram. Our email is Rewriting Her Story Podcast at gmail.com. And we are Rewriting Her Story Podcast on YouTube, which we have videos out that you should go like and view. So it helps us. Yes. There's like, like three views on the videos. I'm like, guys, watch us. <laughs> We do funny shit. (laughs) Anyways, so questions, concerns, comments, please just shoot us an email. If there are any topics that you'd like covered in the podcast, please also, we love, love, love suggestions. Um, We're gearing up to kind of batch out some more of these podcasts and we have some of our own, but we would also love any suggestions. Mm -hmm. So until next time, we love you guys. Bye. Bye.